John's there now we can start. You know? Because a lot of people just sliding in from other tours. And they all have that look on their face of panic. <laughs> I think it's time we go ahead and get started on our, on our clinic here. The, uh, I introduce myself. My name is Lloyd Larson. I live in Grand Island, Nebraska. Uh, if you know where that is or not, it's uh, about three hours from here by phone. Uh, <laughs> I live right next to the UP track where it crosses the Burlington, so we're very fortunate to have a lot of trains there to watch. That's why I model a Penzi. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't give me a bad time. I know there's people who don't like the Penzi, but if they admit it, that's the first step to recovery. Uh, we're going to do the clinic in three parts. The first one will be slides, a little bit of how to do it. There will be some real basic things, some very simple things. It will progressively get a little more complicated for, for you so you don't get bored. We'll take a break in the middle, do some hands-on, make a scene, do some backdrops. And then the third part, we'll get real deep. You don't want to miss that. It has to do with the long-term effects of the collision of dissimilar molecules on an HO layout and theoretical time based on the Big Bang Theory and a few other real high-tech things. So, <laughs> and I said it would get real deep. It will. Uh, I ask that you hold questions till the middle when we have a break. There's a couple reasons for that. First of all, if you ask me, I'll forget where I am. I'll start all over again and I'll like that. Second of all, we may answer what you need to know. Third, you'll be so confused at the end you won't know what you're going to ask anyway. So <laughs> We'll be all right. I got one of these new laser deals, pretty slick. Got it off my neighbor's rifle. He likes to hunt. I'm going to put it back before he gets home. Somebody's lying about lasers, though. I tried this thing for two hours of the night on a piece of balsa and couldn't cut one thing with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> let me say these laser cut kits, I think they're kidding us. But anyway, we'll get on to the real educational part of this now. Well, one other thing I want to do is, is keep you here, keep your interest. So, we're going to have, a, at the end, a drawing for some big prizes. And uh, I went to a clinic earlier today, and a nice lady had drawings. I don't know if any of you have gone to that or not. She had tickets. We didn't have tickets, but we got a unique way of picking the winners, and there will be some horrendous prizes. <laughs> so we'll start the slide part of this. Uh, you want to catch the lights? Oh, I'd like to introduce Steve Snook, uh, my main man back there. He, I couldn't get along without him. He's okay. This isn't even my slide. <laughs> We're going to start out here with the with the basic layout. This, <laughs> this, this is how most people start. You got your plywood, you got your track, you got that engine. You spend about 400 hours detailing and putting couplings on, and it looks good except the background's a little bit distracting here. And what we're going to do the first step, we're going to cover that up. And that's that's what that's the main purpose of backdrops. You can uh, do a lot of stuff with them. We're going to look at some things you can do with them. But the main purpose is to hide that. I don't know how many of you have been on layout tours where the sewer pipe's coming down on the wall. Somebody flushes it and 40 people look at the pipe. I, I <laughs> but anyway, we've taken a giant step forward here with just a simple blue background. Here's the high-tech tools we're going to use. We're going to talk about how to shake them. You shake them horizontal. You point the knob away from you. You use white or light gray on a blue. Put a little bit of it on the bottom, about the bottom two-thirds. What that does is create the illusion of mist in the air and, and starts to give you some distance. You want a cloud? People are obsessed with clouds. We'll show you a couple ways to make them here. A little darker blue or gray. Be careful of grays. A lot of them have a green in it. It doesn't look right. But just spray a little random on there. Make yourself a stencil. Now, there's some wonderful stencils you can buy, but if you're like us in the middle of nowhere, 
we got one hobby shop and he's got one tube of glue and that's it. <laughs> we got to do a lot of things on our own. So we get a piece of stencil paper for about a quarter. You go down and you look at your tax return, or figure out how much your wife spent shopping and you start making stencils. And it's a lot of fun. You just rip them up. Uh, the only trick there is try not to make one that looks like anybody you know. And you, <laughs> you kind of hold it up there. Spray a little bit along the edge and you get a cloud. The neat thing about this is you can rip off a little more, you can just keep working it so you don't have any big expense, and you don't have any two clouds that are the same. But just don't overdo it. Just a little bit of the tops and then spray it in, getting the light down below there. Nothing fancy, but you don't want a real fancy backdrop. There are wonderful, beautiful backdrops, but all of a sudden you can get in a situation like uh, the Sistine Chapel. Everybody knows who painted the roof. Poor guy that did the floor must be the most frustrated person in, in the world. You know? <laughs> so what you want to do, you want to complement your models. You want to set a, a scene for them. You want to create an atmosphere. You want to create a season. And you can do that very simply with the, with the background and the scenery that's between the track and the back. Here we're laying a little horizon line. Just cut a simple stencil. It's going to be a mountain scene using cool colors, using blue hit the edge of it, and you've got a, a mountain horizon. Nothing fancy. Don't want anything too fancy. It'll distract from it. A little trick, if you want to uh, put a structure or something where the eye will go, have that horizon line go down in a V, and a, the eye will follow right down to that. In this case, you'll notice how the eye follows the curve right down to a run. Oh, that's no problem. We're going to hide it anyway. We'll just paint a little more paint on it. <laughs> a little more light on it. <coughs> Here's a neat product. It's, it's a fabric called fleece. It comes in two colors. It comes in white and it comes in black. And you can create background trees by the millions with this stuff. If you're doing a winter scene like we are here, take the white, overspray it with a little brown on the top, and it suddenly takes on the impression of a lot of trees far off with snow on the ground and the top sticking out. Dead trees winter trees. See? Again, it's not super detailed, but you want the super detailed items down here. That's where you're going to spend the time. That's where you want the people to look. Throw in a little basic styrofoam scenery. Some trees. Again, we're not super detailing it. We're making background scenery. And you've got a pretty decent scene there. Now put your buildings and your structures in there. You got, and you've created an atmosphere. Notice how you feel cold, but it's all the cool colors. Blues, grays, whites. We'll do another one. Real simple. Same principle. Only we use green this time. Do a summer scene. Lay in a couple horizon lines. Take the stencil and tear it rugged. Looks like treetops when you do that. Throw it up there. Spray the top edge. A little white in there. Get the black fleece this time. Spray a little green on it, put it over masonite form just to form up so it stands by itself. And you start to create the illusion of thousands and thousands of trees in the background. Again, the white spray, pushing it back, creating a mist feeling and distance. Notice the nice edge that the fleece gets when you form it around the, the masonite. Looks like treetops. That leaves you time to build the super detailed trees in front. Again, styrofoam form, simple scenery back there, and you got a deal. We're going to revert back, show you how to make those forms. I use a, if you use a styrofoam, be sure and get the pink or the gray. There's a white out there, and when you cut it, a million little teeny turning circles come out, and they get all over everything, and you'll have them on your clothes for weeks, and it's just not a good deal. But hot glue it, it's a quick way to do it, it sticks pretty good. I use burlap a lot. I do not use wire screen. It's, I like it much better because it doesn't jab under my fingernails and it doesn't short out my tracks. I can short out my tracks myself without any help. Again, <laughs> hot glue it on there, get a form. Takes a nice fold, takes plaster well, lay over a little plaster. <coughs> We're going to make some trees here for that mountain scene. This day I've used toothpicks here, a little bit of woodland scenic products, great products. Uh, the a little sticky glue there. And you get a pretty good looking background tree. What I've done on this one is just taken the X-Acto knife and, and 
scored it a little bit and pried it up so it appears to be branches. Now you're doing is create an illusion. For the trees you want a little bit closer, uh, these barbecue skewers are great. They're pointed already. Cut them length, drill a few holes in there, take some wire, strip the insulation off, cut those ends and you got some real nice fine wire, stick it through the holes, paint the thing with electrical tape. And what that does is give it a little bit of body on those branches and then uh, put a little foliage on the top. It's a good looking tree. If you want to go a little bit further, you can, you can paint it light brown and then peel off a little bit of that uh, rubberized tape and it looks like bark that's come off from it. It leaves a bare spot on the tree. Uh, this is a mountain scene a little more like out here. Again, the foam. This time we're using the fleece, putting it back here to appear pine trees that are down below the, the um, line where the trees quit growing. A little snow on top, which is simply white plaster with a little blue mixed in it. Uh, not the greatest slide in the world, but you can see how, how it forms the loose the trees. Here's what we did. We took a wire brush and brushed that up so that it pulled them up to spikes and it looked like the tops of pine trees. And there you start to see. I use a little polyfoam in front so I can plant the other trees in there. But this is just a solid mass of that, uh, that fabric, that fleece. This is cut out of foam board. We took and painted it light green and dark green and then took a cloth and wiped it off. For the snow, I simply grabbed one edge of it and ripped off a little bit of it. And you start to get a pretty credible scene. Very simple, very quick. But notice how the trees point up here. And, and to the eye, those look like pine trees. That's what we spend most time doing is tricking the eye in our basement anyway. Now we're going to take a little bit of a look at track. How to detail that. Make it look pretty good. A lot of good commercial tracks on on the market. This is, I think, um, Code 83. I'm not even sure who made it, but first thing I do is cut a few ties random, the ends off so that it appears that they're uneven. Just a little bit. Want to make some fish plates or tie plates? Get the old ponch wheel out, run a couple lines on some .015 styrene. Makes a little rivet detail there. Cut them off, glue them on the side. Don't use anything real thick on the inside, though, or you'll have troubles with tracking. And actually, in all reality, when you're done, it's very hard to see these. They give a nice impression, but they don't stand out. They do add to the realism, but they aren't eye catchers. Paint that uh, use flats colors on your ties. A little bit there. The uh, the simplest way to, to eliminate a lot of problems in the track is to get some Wall's hair clipper oil and Q-tips and rub the top of it before you start painting it. What that does is create a barrier where the paint won't stick. It's always fun to order a case of this from your barber too. He has no idea what you're doing with it. It just drives him nuts. <laughs> yeah. Use uh, flat colors. Uh, this is Ace and this is Flow Color. I don't see a lot of difference. Uh, just take and spray a brown or black make it blotchy. Once it's dried, take a piece of homo soap and just rub the top of that and that paint will come right off. In fact, you can take some molds and soak it into a piece of homo soap and it makes a pretty good track cleaner by just rubbing along there. Uh, we'll do a quick branch line here. This is a good product. Ames or the instant road bed. Put it down. We got our painted track here. Notice how once you painted that, the uneven brown and the, and the, the black side rails that it appears to be smaller. You take uh, code 83 or code 100, and once you paint it, it almost looks as half as big as it did before. It looks much more prototypical. Very simple thing to do. Here we've taken some flat browns and grays and hit some other ties just to give them a random look. And they look a little harsh at that point, but once you ballast it, uh, it seems to all blend in. Here we put a little white ballast in there. And here's one thing that, that very few people model, and it's very it adds a nice touch and that is get some black oil paint or any kind of black paint and paint the center down there. Every engine, be it steam or diesel, lost oil and grease down the center. You very seldom see that on layout. If you're running old Alcos, you might as well buy black paint by the gallon because they threw it out pretty quick. <laughs> now we got to look at poles here a little bit. Poles are the most common trackside structure and probably the least accurately modeled. And there are some good, good pole kits out. 
But it just takes a couple more steps to make them right. This is an end scale one. We're going to spray flat brown, flat gray. The grayer represents the older ones, brown, newer ones. Just enough to get rid of the sheen. And then we're going to take a little bit of the scribbles, glitter paint. Great stuff. So that's fabric stores, comes in all different colors. Take that and just touch it to the insulators. It goes on as kind of a milky color, but once it dries, it looks just like glass. It has a sparkle to it. You can get it in greens, reds, clears. Scribbles? scribbles or marks. There's two brand names, about 99 cents for a jar of it. Lasts forever. Uh, this is a Rick's HO pole. Paint it gray. Use a base color. You can use a foundation or a battleship gray, light color. Then what I like to do after you've got it painted is get a pair of pliers, squeeze it, and just pull it down through there. And what that does is give it a real nice wood grain effect. Now, if you're doing a detailed model, you know, for a contest or whatever, what you can do while the paint's still wet is sprinkle a little bit of fine ballast on there and squeeze it with the pliers and it looked like knot holes. I showed this to my wife and I said, look, I've made plastic look like wood. She says, great, why don't you buy wood to start out with? <laughs> well, you can't have that kind of attitude. You know? <laughs> Paint the bottom part black. Represents the treatment they use in poles to keep them from being in there. They never did the whole pole very often, especially in early days. They'd only do about the first four or five feet of it. Uh, a little blue-gray on the cross arms. And weather the cross arms, same way you did the pull. There's the blue gray on the cross arms. That makes a good galvanized color. Dull coat everything. Come back with the glitter paint again and touch those, those insulators on it. What happened here? Fell off my pole? There we go. And here's some of the things you can do with a pole that's seldom modeled. A guy wire comes down. Use a piece of wire, a little bit of wire insulation down there. They always had a wood brace at the bottom. Don't know what that was for. Uh, again, uh, this is just a drop of super glue that's been painted with a glitter paint to represent a uh, insulator so that when lightning hit it, it didn't go down the ground. Uh, you got your steps up here and you got a little transformer, which in that case looks a lot like a part of a brake shoe or a brake system off a boxcar. A uh, couple little poles here. Uh, mile markers. Very seldom you see those modeled, and every railroad used them. There's a half mile marker. Down at the bottom down here, a lot of times in soil that was loose, they'd use another pole beside it and bolt it to it, so they had two of them. Uh, a plate on the bottom of the pole, an uh, iron plate, would be bolted to it if it was near anywhere where vehicles parked. They didn't care about your car, but they didn't want the pole banged up all the time. And, uh, at this point, we're going to pass a little bit of the stuff around. You take a look at it and see what you think. And then we'll get back to, to more slides and show you how this stuff works on a, on a layout. And we'll detail a little bit of an end scale layout here. You get some lights, Mr. Snook? You're still all here. I'm going to pass around some of these pools. And here's a little bit of that glitter paint, you guys want to just... That spray material, did you call that fleece? Yep. Where do you get it? At any fabric store. And what is it supposed to be used for? Oh, mm -hmm. World War II, they lined helmets out of it so they'd stay warm. But they use it for a lot of jacket liners. Do and do the same thing with uh, sweatshirts and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. A little bit finer, be a little bit further back. Yeah, I mean. The smaller stuff looks like it's back further. The, um, either way, once you get beyond six inches you're on the track, there's really no scale. There's a for tall grass. There's a lot of uh, fabric material that's uh, fake fur, different colors that you could use. We'll show you that some of that here too. There you go. Just as, yeah, no, just the same thing on the poles. I was just using double cross arms, put them on each side. So.
Yeah, you can do four or six, however many you want. Uh, this is the trees. You want to pass that around? It's uh, how they're the skeleton of them. Anyway, let me clear this off and we'll see if we can make a scene. <laughs> We're going to do a few clouds and show you how to make a stencil, hopefully. The stencil material, I think, is 25 cents a sheet, so you don't have to worry too much about it. And you start out, you make a real scientific rip here. Like I say, you try not to make it look like anybody you know. This material I thought was blue until I got it home, and it turned out to be kind of a gray. And uh, it's not a bad color. The other thing about sky is not all sky is blue. If you're doing an industrial, I'll use gray and a little bit of pink on it and uh, be creative on it. And I, like I say, I thought that was blue until I got some blue and I'll just hit it right quick here. So what we're going to do here is the reverse. We're going to have all clouds and a little bit of sky. Just like it's shining through a little bit. Nothing too wild. Make another quick stencil. If anybody f feels faint here in the front row because of fumes, let me know. Anybody other than me, I mean. <laughs> kind of keep your clouds rounded rather than pointed. But, uh, See, it doesn't take an awful lot to uh, to get the effect, and you don't want to overdo it. Do one more little bit here, then. See, nothing fancy, but it it's an effect for you. Of course, the light was a little bit better in here, but it's, we live with what we got. I hadn't planned on it, but I guess I did. <laughs> I weathered my thumb pretty good, too. <laughs> See if we can sneak that out here right quick. Um, uh, that particular blue is a, oh, it's a light blue, XO25. Yeah, we're going to have an operating session here in a minute. <laughs> well, there you go. That creates an illusion of depth. You haven't overworked it. Spend your time on the models rather than the, the backdrop. Um, here's a piece of that foam board. It's just very simple. Nothing, nothing fancy at all. But it does add another, another level in there for you. And the blues and the grays go good with this particular scene. Because it's kind of cool. Mountains typically are cool, I think. We don't have any in our area, but I've been told they are. But it's pretty hot in here, so I think we can go to a winter scene maybe and drop the temperature about 30 degrees.
I bet you're all here because of the drawing, aren't you? <laughs> It doesn't take a lot of time. You don't want to make a career out of doing your background scenery, but you want to do it well. Most of these scenes that can be created in one afternoon or an evening. And, uh, but again, see how the, uh, the cool colors complement the winter scene? Here's a little bit of that fleece you were asking about. White fleece. Real high-tech deal. Just a little bit glued on a board. A little brown paint on the white. Snow covered hills. You want to see one more? That's good because I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> We're going to go from cold to hot. Santa Fe country. Or Nebraska this year, it hasn't rained all year. Like I was saying before, the sky is not always blue. Like very seldom is it blue. And we'll prove that here in a minute. That you can use other colors. Oh, here's something else you can pass around. Will you? Okay, let's, let's do some uh, ready track that's been detailed a little bit. Uh, notice how this doesn't quite work as well with the, with the blue sky. I've got one here that is... Well, we got the gosh darndest yellow orange you've ever seen. I used to have a house this color. Wasn't bad till I parked my blue car in the driveway and everybody got sick. I heard that. <laughs> But notice how it just looked like it warmed up 20 degrees when you went to a, a light orange sky, yellow sky. Yep. Yeah, it did. You ready for a drawing? Yeah. All right. If you look on the back of your handout. Does it have an A on the back? Anybody got the A? <laughs> Before you do, let me explain what the prize is. It's a anvil out of the shop at Fulton, California. It was originally from the Fulton Area Rapid Transit. That's got the initials on it, so it's quite a collector's item. Well, I think we might have given that away earlier. Maybe. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Anybody got one with a P on it? There's a man. Oh, did you fly, drive, or? Yes. Do you have access to a safety deposit box? Yes. A Husker pencil with corn on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the anvil. Before it's over with, we're going to give away 20 delightful baby chicks. I thought you poked the air holes in the box. <laughs> Didn't you do it? I think we're down to one prize, folks. That's not it. Ooh. Anyway, let's take another little avenue. Everybody uses solid material for a backdrop. There are products out there, plexiglass and, 
and other materials that are transparent that makes wonderful backdrops. And it changes the whole principle of things because you can light from the back forward. It creates effect. It gets rid of background shadows. And it's fun to work with. It doesn't take a lot of room. What I use is called polypropylene. It's a sheeting used for truck bodies. They line them so that it doesn't scratch the walls or whatever. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. I got it from uh, Joseph T. Ryerson Plastics. I'm sorry, I got to turn my back on you here. Now. But there's uh, just about any plastic company seems to have it. And it comes in different uh, widths, and I suspect they have it in coil so that you can get it cut to length. I got four by eight sheets. I think they were about, uh, oh, 30 some dollars a sheet. And this is what we're using right here on this. Uh, I use a one eighth uh, or three thirty seconds. You don't want to get quarter or what, anything heavier because it uh, gets quite heavy. I'm hit the lights there, Steve. This is one with a uh, put a little bit of uh, glow paint under a black light, and you put it on either side, and it looks like the. You've got some depth there in the in the stars. I'm kind of getting a lot of light over here. Can you people see all right, or I'm in your way? Just simply luminous paint. Yeah, same people that make the scribbles paint make a luminous paint. Anybody know where that light is? It's shining down. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> Anybody got a BB gun? <laughs> Another thing you can do by putting light behind it. All right, now those clouds are simply cut out plastic pieces. They're glued at different depths on it, depending on how close they are to the to the layout. Pardon? I'll show you here in a minute. I'll take it out. But this is polypropylene sheeting. Behind it is a, a light diffuser, and that's just simply what they use in fluorescent lights in this building and every other one. You can get them at a hardware store, and uh, so that it diffuses the light and blurs it out. Um, sure could. Sure could. Plexiglass comes in a lot of different colors. You could use white with different colored lights behind it and experiment with it and see what happens. Uh, I'm sure there's a zillion things you can do and that's what I want you to do is think beyond the box of having just plain hard backdrops. There's a lot of things you can do with this. You can have fun with it. Try one little bit here. You want to do that? It really impresses the neighbors. Put a little sprinkler on overhead where they stand. <laughs> Here's a couple pieces. I'll just pass these around of that polypropylene. How do you camouflage the joints in that material? Get some wide, clear tape and put it on the back. And it, you're going to have a seam there that you can see, but it's not really outstanding on it. The other thing you do is try to bring your scenery up to it so that you don't have a full four-foot seam right there. But it, it hides pretty well when you put the tape on it. Have you ever, I've changed the subject to hair. Have you ever done anything with the mirrors? Mirrors? Yeah. Yeah, I have one area in my layout where because, I use... Uh, I was hoping that this, with all these clinics, somebody would touch on mirrors. I do use them. Nobody has, and I have no idea how you do it, and I know it looks great if you use them right. What's the one thing you want to remember if you use a mirror is to use a front reflecting mirror. That way when you put something up to it, there is no space. They're expensive, but they make a world of difference. What I was interested in is how you use them in the town. Um, it's your depth of streets and all yeah. that. There's different ways you got to play with it. You use a lot of angles. The big trick is so that you don't see yourself in the mirror. 
You just keep it at an angle. You never have a 90 degree corner. It's always at an angle. Okay. Explain, explain up front reflecting mirror as opposed to a normal mirror. Yeah. About 80% more money. Yeah. What happens is the, it evidently has two coatings on it versus one. And, it, the, and if you take a regular mirror, like a household mirror, and you put a stick against it, no matter how close you get it, there will be a space the thickness of the glass. With the front reflecting, you, you lose that space and it just goes as one. Now your normal mirror that you know, if you have a big, great big mirror in the wall, or right. vanity in the bathroom, is that a front reflecting? Or no, no, no. You have to go to a mirror company and it specifically yeah, ask for it. It's not a real common item. Now uh, what sizes would you normally have cut? I would, whatever you, you need. I think about 36 by 36 is about the biggest you're going to get. That's the biggest front reflecting one piece mirror that you'll get probably. Yeah. So, but anyway, we'll move on with this. We got some other things to cover here. How do you mount this The way you mount it, the way I did it is that I got uh, some uh, Velcro that's taped on one side along the top of the ceiling. I used the uh, joints where the drop ceiling were. Reverse the L angle and just simply taped uh, male and female Velcro, put it up there. Now to take it down, you can't grab it. So you get these little suction cups at the glass company and you grab it with that and take it down. And uh, we'll show you how that's done here in some more slides. Actually, this next part will cover some of your questions, I'm sure. And. Uh, I'll set up this next part a little bit. What it is, this is uh, some photos of how I've used the material on my layout. It's based on a true story. I'm sure it's true. It was handed down by my uncle. My uncle used to travel a lot in uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio during the 40s and 50s photographing stuff. And he had a, a white 47 Plymouth van that he drove around. My uncle Oscar also had a set of uh, sense of humor because he put a set of F7 blot horns under the hood <laughs> and he was always looking for stories and he pulled into Altoona one day and he saw a sign painter and what the guy was painting had to have a story behind it so uh, he pulled in and gave him the horn which he probably shouldn't have done <laughs> that was my uncle down there on the right but as soon as he got the guy off there off the top there, he asked him why he was painting a sign that said Altoona's third annual barbecue, Horseshoe Curve, September 18th, sponsored by the Sheriff's Department. It's rather unusual that the Sheriff would sponsor a picnic, but here was a story that related to that. It was a, a nice evening, and it was Friday night. Saturday promised to be beautiful, and there was always a lot of rail fans that went to Horseshoe Curve. And it was late in the year, September, October, most of the leaves were gone. It was one of those great days when the air is fresh and everything, and Saturday morning was going to dawn bright and early. And they were all going to head out to the curve with uh, their video cameras, take some video, which took a lot of time back then because they didn't have tape yet. <laughs> anyway, the locals showed up there. There's Jack Lovejoy, Bill Holloway, these guys all work for the Pennsylvania. They've been retired. They come out and they like to hang out and talk trains and drink out of the scratch-built pop cooler. Things were going along pretty good until all of a sudden there was a roar out of the east and this Chevy pulled up with New York license plates. Not only that, he had lightning stripes on. This is not good. Two dudes stepped out, introduced himself as Slippery Sam and his cohort Elmer. And right away, things started to get a little bit heated. There was accusations made about the New York Central and other ones made about the Pennsylvania. And Fran Johnson that run the cafe had seen this happen before, so she put a call into Altoona to the police department to get somebody out there before things got out of hand. Well, so it happened the only one on work that day was Deputy Corpus. He'd only been on the job two weeks, and he just finished an offensive driving course, and he couldn't wait to get out there. So 
hopped in his car and cranked the siren up and headed out to the curve to quelch this big riot. Almost wiped the mayor out on the way. Screamed across the street. Real hazard to everybody. Went by Elbow Tower just as hard as he could. He's up 40, 50 mile an hour. Flew by the gas station. Really hit the siren here because that had been his last job. It didn't last very long. Only a couple of days. He, uh, he was obsessed with clean cars and the owner's aunt came in and got gas and was washing the windshield. He saw how dirty the floor was. He was thinking about that, and she said, do you have a restroom? And he thought she said, whisk broom, and said, pull it around back, I'll blow it out with a hose, and that ended his career right there. <laughs> so, so he's really showing the owner there that he's got, got the job now. He's screaming down the road and hits the gravel there. He remembers what he does, how to, how to drive on gravel, and flies across the bridge down by the brickyard. Gets airborne there coming across. Slams down, almost loses it on the curve, but he's doing all right. You know, he's having fun. Headed out there. Screamed by Jack Schmidt's place there, just a blur. Up 70, 80 miles an hour. There's Mrs. Shinola's place. Good cook she was. He's up to 80 mile an hour going by Shinola's place. Goes by Kowalski's place. Up there by the car. Kowalski and his boys had a little trouble with the law. He heard the siren coming, he runs out in the yard. Yells at Deputy Corpus as loud as he can. Pig! Pig! Corpus turns around and flips him off. <laughs> Looking back to see what the guy's reaction is and failed to see two pigs in the road. <laughs> <laughs> he belonged to Orville Nelson. He, he just got him back from the county fair with El Bore and the Lady Hindenburg. They take it second and third in the, in the contest. But they got out that day and were on an adventure. Deputy's got problems. He's he got the brakes locked up and he's reared clear back in the back. CD stomping on the brakes hard, but we know what's going to happen here. There just isn't any hope. And it does. <laughs> the day is not going good now. Get out and look to see if there's any damage. <laughs> Poor old Al Board giving his life protecting the lady Hindenburg. Poor well is in a lot of trouble, huh? <laughs> so is Deputy Corpus. So. Anyway, down at the curb, things are still deteriorating. Jack Lovelyoy and Slippery Sam are just about coming to blows. And, and old Jack says, I tell you what, Sam, he says a, a K-4 could outpull Niagara any day, power and speed. Slippery Sam said, when pigs fly, <laughs> was followed immediately by a, by a horrendous rush of air. And the second time in <laughs> the second time the Lady Hindenburg crashed, you know. This time she took out a New York attorney with her and his buddy's really interested in where that pig came from. He's still looking up there. Anyway, back to the scene of the wreck. Well, Corpus knows he's got to call this in. He better call it in as a Code B for bad wreck, pigs in the grill. Well, he does. And half the town's got scanners, and they thought he said cold beer, pigs on the grill, horseshoe curve. And they all head out. <laughs> oh, tur he's, he's directing traffic at his own wreck, huh? Finally, there they go, roaring down there. Figure there's a barbecue going on. Smoke clears. Even L is gone. Corpus walks on down the street. He's never heard from again. <laughs> but the group down there had a good time. They settled their differences, had a heck of a barbecue and some cold beer. And everything worked out pretty good. Only problem was the lady Hindenburg was shunned for a while because they thought they said she laid with an attorney rather than laid on an attorney. But the other pigs came back to her <laughs> later on and, and things worked out pretty good. We don't know what happened to Deputy, Deputy Corpus. Uh, we think the attorney's got him because every once in a while you hear him yell to judge, we got rid of habeas corpus. That was his first name. <laughs> anyway, the guy's got the video, a work train on there. And as you 
can see by the work train, there's this guy up there. I don't know what to do with my pointer here. I lost my... You know. but anyway, if you notice the sky up there, it's a, that's polypropylene sheeting with some blue lights on. And I also use a lot of whites in the foreground. Uh, that's with full white on both back and front. And it kind of burns it out in the photograph. But it gives a different effect. This is an area where there's cutouts behind the polypropylene to add distance. One is a half inch behind, the other one's about an inch behind. And as they move back, they blur out and become more gray and it creates an illusion of distance real quick. That whole scene there is probably eight inches deep from the track to the wall. Again, we've got some blue lights on. Uh, the trees up there kind of give you a gray. The, the material itself is kind of gray, but the blue don't bleed through it. A lot of people ask in this photo, how do you do the smoke on the train? It's very easy. You can only do it once. You plug your wires directly to the wall and to the track. <laughs> so you want to be ready with a camera. Here's the poles we were talking about. Uh, loose ground. You've got an extra brace there. I don't, in this picture, have wires strung on there, but uh, hopefully I will someday. Again, up in the corner, see the sky? It's blue. A little bit of white bleeding through there. And we'll show you the same thing again. You get some really nice effects with it. There's some red lights behind it, and the other lights turned down low, and you can create a really neat sunrise or sunset effect. <laughs> And this is the train headed down to Horseshoe Curve with the sunset behind it. You can go down to just about twilight. Uh, you can create a lot of atmosphere feeling with it. We use a lot of other sounds on the layout, like uh, you got a tape that plays uh, the sound of wind in the trees all the time, and it's just a white sound, but you miss it if it's not there. Uh, just about dark, a little bit of backlight, a little bit of front. Kind of a late evening, early morning. Atmosphere is what you're doing. There's a sunrise or sunset. Going into nighttime. The one thing about the sheeting, you do get some light reflection off from it. You don't notice it when you see it, but it will show up in photographs, and, and especially at night when you've got the, the black light on it. The moon is simply from Spencer's. It's a cutout deal kids use for their ceiling. It comes with a bunch of stars that are about two foot square, but it's got a nice moon in there. If you want to, you can put that moon on a gear motor and a string, and it just rises and sets beautifully. <laughs> I've got it on tape, and every once in a while it sets real quick. But <laughs> <laughs> a little structure on it. Oh, another quick story. I talked about theoretical time. You can tell what time it is on layout, but just, just the stories it tells. We look at this picture, and we know it's right after Halloween. Um, <laughs> You can pick whatever year you want, but it, it's the day after Halloween. And this is a Kowalski's house we saw earlier. I said he's got two boys that got in a little trouble. Well, this year, let's say it's 1949, they, they had a big idea. They were going to climb out of the upstairs window. They were going to go over to Mrs. Shinola's place who raised the chickens. See her chickens down there? And they were going to take a cherry bomb and throw it in there and cause havoc. And when the chickens flopped around, they were going to grab two of them and go back. Big Halloween prank. She also makes good pies. She's got a couple there on the window. But anyway, the Kowalski boys got all excited. Couldn't wait for it to get dark Halloween. They slipped out their window and came down the road there. And they were in the dark. They got a little confused. And they went by Mrs. Shinola's place and got over to Jack Schmidt's place and threw the cherry bomb into a small building they thought was a chicken house. It turned out to be the outhouse. Methane, gas, a cherry bomb. They got a huge explosion. And Jack Schmidt's in bad trouble because he just had a dinner of pulled pork and plum pudding, you know which created a big conversation down the grill whether the Kowalski boys would ever know the difference between Schmidt and Shinola. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jack makes the lumber yard. Figure he got about six hours work in there before he got to that stage. So if you really analyze what time it is, it's going to be the, the, the Monday or Sunday after Halloween, probably 1.30 in the afternoon, between 1.30 and 1.40. Uh, see, everything has a story if you just look hard enough. This is part of the layout. Now here you can see a lot of the stuff that we were talking about early. Uh, the sheets are hung up here. There's a balance. See the polypropylene and, the, and how they're, they're hung. You do see a joint when you look at them at an angle like that. You don't see it when you look head on to it. 
Uh, there's black light up here. There's also floodlights on there. A lot of people worry about even lighting on a layout. Forget it. The less even lighting you got, the bigger it looks. In fact, I, I'm thinking about trying this. I don't know if it'll work or not. It's putting some small gear motors over those floodlights with a piece of cardboard and let them rotate slowly. And I'm sure it'll give the effect of clouds going across the scene. It'll break it up. And it's a it's slow animation and it creates illusion of depth again. But that shows quite a bit on how it is. There's 22 inches I have behind that that material so I can get back there. There's some staging tracks. But you have to get back to change the bulbs. And I think there's about 126 bulbs in that room. But it doesn't create heat to any extent. They're all 40 watt. They're low. The big, most expensive thing is getting a 600 uh, watt rheostat because you, otherwise you'd have eight gazillion uh, little ones. Took, took this picture just before I got hit by a T1. Uh, another thing about the track work, if you look, part of it's brown, part of it's gray. When you do it, if you've got a grade, spray the upgrade with an overspray of light gray and the downgrade with a little overspray of reddish brown. That'll appear to be sand and brake shoe residue. I gotta tell you about the next slide. We all make mistakes. I don't make many, but when I do, they're pretty good ones. I uh, got a nice layout room, but like everybody else, wanted a little bit more. And I figured out if I could knock a hole in the wall and go in the room where my wife had her washer and dryer, if she'd just move those over a ways and move her ironing area, I could make a loop, create a branch line, get some more staging, and it worked great. You know, my wife, I knew this wasn't gonna be easy, and it's gonna take a concession, so I thought a long time before I asked her. And I had to ask her just the right time, so I was waiting until she was watching that uh, Bridges of Madison County again. She always watches that, likes that movie. Wants me to take the dog to State Fair every year. Uh, anyway, <laughs> she, she's watching that, and I come up and give her the old back rub and say, hey, you know what, if you let me go through the wall into the laundry room and you move your washer and dryer, I could build a branch line in there, and my concession would be, I'll let you name it. Much to my surprise and my joy, she turned right around and spit out a name for that branch line. I was elated. I didn't know she'd been thinking about railroad stuff that much. I flew downstairs, pulled the boxcar out, sent it to the paint shop, had it decaled, set it out there, looked at it. My elation melted like a, disappeared like a pizza at a Weight Watchers convention. Because I realized suddenly I think I'd misunderstood her. I'll make mistakes. <laughs> Again, now you can see the fleece in the backdrop as a, a backdrop for trees. Bring the trees on out in the sky. And that just about winds it up, folks. I got a little display up here that shows a lot of the, the insulators and a lot of places you can use the, the glitter paint. There's bottles, there's broken glass around the scrap pile, there's a, a tail light on the car, there's reflectors on the cross arm, there's green marker lights on the engine. All of this can be done with the glitter paint. And uh, help yourself, come up and take a look at it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, in fact, uh, let me move this one deal now.